We've all heard of the dark web. Its reputation precedes it. It's where criminals lurk. It's where you can buy guns, drugs, stolen identities. If it's illegal, chances are, you can get it on the dark web. Or so we are led to believe. The dark web is often confused with the deep web. So what are they, and how are they different? Eileen Ormsby is an Australian journalist who has written two books and dozens of articles about the dark web. The deep web is much bigger than the normal internet, but all it is is all those pages that can't be searched for or indexed by normal engines like Google. When you go to the bank, your front page is part of the clear web. Anyone can go to it. But once you have to log in, all those pages are part of the deep web. So there's nothing scary about the deep web. The dark web is part of the deep web, but it's a very small part. The way you know that you've got a dark web URL and not a normal website is instead of the normal signifiers like .com, .org, you have .onion. That's how you know that you're on a dark web site. The idea was that the layers of encryption are like the layers of an onion. And that means that you can browse the normal web anonymously, so there's no way that anyone will be able to tell where you're browsing from or where you are. The dark web was actually developed by the United States Naval Research Laboratory as a way to communicate anonymously over the internet. And it was developed to uh, keep military secrets. The idea was it could create a meeting place where neither party needed to know where the other party was in order to have this meeting place. The US government purposely made the dark web public in September of 2002. The most widely used interface was created by a non-profit organization called the Tor Project. It wasn't until 2013 that the dark web got mainstream attention, when news broke of the Silk Road. So Silk Road, as most people know now, was the first major dark web point-and-click drugs market. And it was started by one person who thought there should be a complete free market and anything should be able to be traded between consenting adult parties with no interference by the state. So he had a very hardline um, libertarian viewpoint and then it grew from there. More and more dealers got on, on board and more and more customers came on board. This grew to be first hundreds of thousands and then millions of users. Shortly after the Silk Road was publicly identified, its alleged architect, Ross Albrecht, was arrested in an elaborate sting operation and the Silk Road was shut down. When it was taken down, the FBI immediately said it was worth $1.2 billion. And since his incarceration, two more incarnations have popped up, Silk Road 2.0 and Silk Road 3. The recent story of Tina Jones is a cautionary tale for people visiting the dark web. Tina Jones is a 31-year-old woman from Spillane, Illinois. She's currently charged with four counts of solicitation of murder for hire, two counts of solicitation of murder, and attempted first-degree murder. If convicted, she's eventually looking at possibly up to 40 years in prison. Tina Jones made national headlines after she was arrested for allegedly paying $10,000 in Bitcoin to a website called La Cosa Nostra International to kill her co-worker's wife. Police allege Jones was having an affair with the husband of the intended victim. Murder for hire cases are very rare uh, in the suburbs in general. This case caught our attention because of the use and mention of the dark web and also the Bitcoin currency, which is also a growing trend. The entire plot was uncovered because the TV show 48 Hours was investigating La Cosa Nostra International, where they learned of the intended victim they promptly alerted authorities. They were able to pretty quickly locate the transactions and trace it back to her and her bank account. One of the things about Bitcoin that people don't understand is a lot of times they hear the term anonymous. And it's not really anonymous. Because what the blockchain is, is it's like a large public database. And everything that happens gets recorded on the blockchain and is there for the whole world to see. So you actually have lots of forensic blockchain companies that track a transaction and with enough information you can track that right back to the person. The 
Cosa Nostra International is bogus and it's a guy operating out of the Middle East. The escrow was a scam, so anybody that wanted to carry out a hit would pay the, the Bitcoin. It'd just be like the classic Nigerian prince scams where he'd say, oh, you know, the hitman was on his way, but, um, you know, something happened. We need some more money. We need some more money. And he would just suck as much money as he possibly could out of these would-be murderers. He'd say, oh, I'm doing the world a favour. These people are paying tens of thousands of dollars to kill somebody. I'm scamming them out of that money. I'm doing a good thing. La Cosa Nostra International was not the first scam site the proprietor made. Back in 2016, one of his ventures also made headlines. I've managed to get a backdoor into the Visa Mafia website thanks to a friendly hacker in the UK. And once we, was, we were in there, we were able to see all the messages coming and going. One of the targets was a woman by the name of Amy Allwine. And someone called Dog Day God had paid about $13,000 to take a hit out on her. So the FBI went and visited Amy and they said, you know, do you have any idea who might have taken out this uh, hit on you? And she had no idea. She couldn't imagine that anyone wanted to kill her. She was killed um, a short time later. And it was, in fact, her husband. He got scammed out of all his Bitcoin. He decided to, to do the job himself. He keeps opening new sites. People keep falling for it all around the world and he's still making money. It appears that Stephen Alwine and Tina Jones were both misled by the sinister reputation of the dark web. How much of that notoriety is actually true? All of the headlines are about, you know, kids can go into their bedroom and download drugs directly to their veins from the internet sort of thing, which is not exactly how the dark web works, but that's what everybody hears about. The whole idea of having your computer infected, it's gonna actually happen more often on the clear web than it is on the dark web. People say that they went on the dark web and then um, you know, two minutes later they got a phone call from somebody and they didn't know who. That sort of thing does not exist. People can make it more frightening than it really is. There's an awful lot of creepy pasta stories that um, are just ridiculous. It is easy to get caught up in the headlines and the folklore associated with the dark web. But it's important to remember what Tor was originally designed for and how it has practical functions beyond illegal markets. It's super important for whistleblowers and you'll see that a lot of newspapers now actually have onion mirrors of their own sites where people can upload whistleblowing information uh, safe in the knowledge that it can't be tracked back to them. We give up our privacy willingly in return for convenience, but I don't think people realise just how much we've given away. You know, the privacy tools that Tor provides to us will become more and more integrated into our computers as people demand to be able to have that control over their digital footprint again.